Life is meaningful. You are real. This is quantum consciousness. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment below, and write a review. Join me deep inside the mystery of numbers. Come and help a metaphysical view. Zero concepts become objects and then become quantia. Join us for an episode of quantum consciousness. Hi there, welcome back. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode three of the Quantum Consciousness Podcast. All righty. So last week, we talked about the three world model by Roger Penrose. So to briefly recap, because I'll be referencing some of these concepts here, um, the basics of this model is that there are three worlds, as opposed to a single world in most physicalist theories, or a dualist view with two worlds, um, namely the mind and the body, um, the three world model introduces a third level. So to recap that model, the physical world is the measurable, observable physical universe around us. The mental world is our consciousness, our thoughts, our feelings, um, everything in our subjective experience. And then finally, the third world is the platonic world, as Roger Penrose calls it. And the platonic world is essentially a world that is beyond any individual and beyond any sort of physical instantiation. This is the world of mathematics, of forms, of concepts. So these mathematical understandings are beyond any one individual to, to sort of access and understand those concepts. And it's also beyond any physical instantiation. Um, it's really the, the rules and the laws that govern the physical world, but it's not reducible to um, any sort of physical uh, expression in, in itself. All right, so in quantum mechanics, uh, I'll be talking about three basic principles which govern quantum mechanics. And disclaimer, I am not a physicist. Um, but when you're grappling with a concept like quantum consciousness, um, I really think that there's no one truly qualified to discuss everything going on. So if you have additional information to provide or to complement this, um, this video, please uh, write a comment, send me an email, um, and we can further the discussion. All right, so without further ado, the three principles of quantum mechanics are measurement, superposition, and entanglement. And in order to describe any one of these principles, you really have to go through all three of them. Um, they're all very interrelated, and so understanding one of them necessarily sort of requires a discussion of the other two. Um, so you'll see that I'll introduce them all in turn, but there will be uh, a lot of reference to the, to the other ones. And then we'll discuss uh, three different experiments related to each of these three different principles that really highlights um, what they're kind of about. And then we'll end with a discussion of quantum computers and how they integrate all three of these principles and use them actively. And then we will talk about uh, what this means for consciousness and how these three principles of quantum mechanics relate to the human mind and um, our own subjective experience. All right. So the first principle is the measurement principle. And measurement is essentially what we're doing all day when we look out in the world around us. It is the collection of data or the observation of physical states. Um, and in a quantum mechanical framing, measurement is the reduction of a system into an observable, discrete, um, physical measurement that we can make. And so what is going on when you're not measuring a system? Well, this is superposition. And so in quantum mechanics, um, everything in the physical world and everything in the world is really described as a wave function. And so there's these wave functions, and they are essentially these probabilistic fields um, that encompass many possible physical states. So for example, when we talk about a photon, a photon or a single particle of light is a wave function of all of its possible um, speeds and locations. 
So the wave function of the photon is describing in that moment um, where in space and time could this photon be. And then we apply a measurement and we observe that the photon is in fact here or moving at this speed. Um, and so there's sort of a reduction of all possible futures or all possible physical realities in the wave function in that superposition into just a single measurement or a single observation. All right, and then the third principle of quantum mechanics is entanglement. And entanglement is the idea that multiple wave functions or multiple quantum systems can have uh, sort of a relationship or a systematic relationship between different systems even though they are separated by space or even time. And so entanglement um, sort of suggests that when you measure one system, it has an effect on other systems that might not be physically present in that local reality, um, but they're off in some other distant location and they can still sort of feel the effect um, of that measurement. So that was a lot. And now we're gonna go through it all again in the context of different experiments that really established um, these basic different principles. All right, so first off, we'll be talking about the double slit experiment. And the double slit experiment is truly mind blowing. I think it will really change your world if you haven't heard about it, um, but it really is sort of the foundation of most of quantum mechanics. A lot of the things we discuss will come back to this one experiment. Um, and it truly kind of rocks the way that we think about, you know, what is reality at this really basic level. Okay, so the double slit experiment is, um, to set the stage, you have a far wall that is um, sort of unable to be permeated. And then you have a intermediary wall between you and that far wall. And let's say that intermediary wall we knock out a couple panels in that wall such that there are two different windows or slits that give you access to that far wall. Okay, then you take um, some sort of projectile. For this uh, example, we'll just say you have uh, a gun and you're shooting bullets at this far wall, but you have to pass through this intermediary wall first. And so you can imagine uh, it's pretty simple to think about what this would look like. Um, either you hit that intermediary wall and the bullet is stopped, or you pass through one of the two slits, um, in which case you can then measure at the far wall um, where the bullets ended up. So let's say you just fully unload onto this wall and you go measure that far wall and you see um, what is the distribution of bullets at the far wall. And what you see uh, sort of expectedly is that there are two bands where the bullets have hit the far wall. Um, essentially just lining up with those slits uh, between you where you were shooting and that far wall. Okay, so then, you know, that, that's like the simple physical particle version of reality. Now, what happens if we take um, a stream of photons or a stream of electrons and we recreate this experiment at a much smaller scale? And so what you find if you shoot a beam of photons or electrons um, at this at these double slits what you find is somewhat surprising but you find a uh, an interference pattern and this is essentially if you were to take a wave and cast the wave at those two slits then from where the wave passes through those two slits you get two more waves and those waves interact with each other so when the crest of two waves meet they double and make a super wave. When the trough of the two waves meet, they double and make a super trough. Um, and then when a wave going up and a wave going down meet, uh, they neutralize and cancel each other out. And so you get this interference pattern on the back wall, which is essentially the superposition or summation of these two different waves interfering with each other. So one way to think about this is okay, the photons went through the two slits and they're sort of bouncing off of each other. And as the photons bounce off each other, they make this um, pattern on the far wall. 
Um, so how, how do we think about this? What's the next step? The next step is let's slow our stream down just to a single photon and shoot a single photon at the two slits. And what do you think is gonna happen? There's no other photons for it to interact with or bounce around with. Um, and so what do we find? We find that even a single photon will create the interference pattern. And this is kind of mind blowing because it essentially means that the photon is acting like a wave and not like a particle, right? It's not a bullet, but instead the single uh, photon travels out as a wave, hits the far wall, and then creates two waves going through both of the slits simultaneously, and then it interferes with itself, right? So the single photon is superposing forming a superposition into both of these different slits, and then they're interacting with each other. Um, so that's kind of fascinating, and what does that really mean? Uh, but that's not even the half of it. Okay, so this is where it gets uh, really interesting. So what we can now do is let's take a small atom, and we'll put it at one of the two slits. And the atom is such that when the photon goes through one of those slits, it actually hits the atom and it gets absorbed into the atom. And we can measure that the atom absorbed the photon, okay? So this atom that we've put at one of the slits is acting as a measurement device. And so what do you think will happen now? Well, if you send the photon at the double slits, when it hits uh, that one slit, it gets absorbed, right? It gets absorbed into the atom and we detect it. Um, the other half of the time, it goes through the other slit and essentially gets converted back to a particle. And so this is really bizarre because the photon is being sent through and by measuring one of the slits, you essentially remove that interference pattern. So the photon is no longer acting like a wave, but it's acting like a particle. And so essentially, the photon, you know, the, the, the question that arises from this is, is the photon a wave or is it a particle? And the answer is really that it is a wave transitioning into a particle and then back into a wave and then back into a particle. And what we're observing is this superposition and measurement process where the photon will wave out into all these possible realities and then it gets measured and it collapses back into that individual state and then it waves out again from that point. So one, one little nuance of this is that if the particle is going towards the left-hand slit and the atom is in the right-hand slit, even though it goes to the left and it never touched the atom, it no longer can interfere with itself because that other superposition got collapsed. So by putting a measuring device in its path, even if it doesn't end up going down that path, it still changes the future of the photon, right? You've removed the interference of this other path and now it's just locked into this one path. So I think that is kind of a bizarre thing to think about because something happening in another part of your path is affecting you even though you're not even, you don't even end up going down that path essentially. Um, so yeah, this is illustrating two different aspects, the superposition aspect and the mostly, mostly the measurement aspect. Alrighty, so on to uh, the second principle. So we were talking about this wave function and this superposition of multiple states. And we were talking about it in the context of a single photon in the double slit experiment. And so the question now is, how do these superpositions come about? What sort of determines the emergence of superpositions? And are these wave functions where these superpositions are held, um, what is the extent to which these wave functions appear in our reality? And so I wanna give the example of uh, a superfluid. 
And the really basic example is liquid helium-2. And so in this experiment, you take a bunch of helium atoms, and each of these helium atoms is a little wave function, right? It has its own little reality. It superposes out. It bumps into another helium atom. The other helium atom collapses it, and it turns back into a particle. And then it wave functions out again and gets hit by another helium atom, and it collapses and then becomes a, a particle for a moment and then goes back into a wave function. So you have all these tiny little billiard balls of helium particles, and they're all superposing and bumping into each other and collapsing each other. Um, and the wave functions are really tiny, and they never get bigger than that single helium atom. Okay. So now in this experiment, what we can do is we can cool down the system and we get the system of, of helium atoms so cold that we're just two degrees or so above absolute zero. So about negative um, 270 uh, degrees um, Celsius. So about two degrees Kelvin or, or getting close to zero. You can't ever reach absolute zero. Um, but that's a discussion for, for another day. All right, so when you cool the liquid helium down to this really, really cold level, this very interesting and bizarre phenomena occurs. And what happens is you see the emergence and the conversion into a superfluid. And a superfluid is essentially where all the helium atoms now share a single wave function. They no longer act independently as separate helium atoms, but they are actually just one system, one wave function governing all of these atoms. All right, this is a very bizarre thing to occur. And now it has all these additional properties. And to understand this, there is um, a number of different things you can do to the, to the liquid helium, uh, the superfluid and you'll have these sort of bizarre um, reactions. So some things are that it has um, zero viscosity, meaning that there's no drag or pull or friction among the atoms. Essentially, they all move in unison together and they're not bumping into each other. Um, and I'll, I'll put a link to, to some more phenomenon that are exhibited here. Um, are these superfluids relevant to our everyday life? Um, well, there's one example which I can drop, uh, which, is, which is relevant, and this is uh, magnetic resonance imaging scanners. So MRI scanners, and MRI scanners utilize these super superfluid properties in that they create superconductors. So what is a superconductor? A superconductor is very similar to this liquid helium example. But here, you supercool a bunch of electrons, and normally electrons are bouncing into each other, creating a bunch of heat and, and bumping into each other, essentially, and collapsing each other. But when you create a superconductor by supercooling the system to just a number of degrees above absolute zero, what you create is a, a superconduction of these electrons, where all of the electrons coalesce into a single wave function. And what does this mean? It means that all the electrons flow down a wire without chaotically bumping into each other. You've created a zero entropy system where there's no chaos, all the electrons flow, and essentially there's near zero loss of power. So it's kind of crazy to think about, but essentially, when you plug in your laptop or your computer and it's using energy and you put it on your, your lap and you know, you're sitting in bed and you have your laptop there, it's going to heat up, right? There's a lot of energy dissipating from the laptop when all these electrons are bumping into each other. And what's crazy about superconductors is there's no loss of energy. So because the electrons aren't chaotically bumping into each other, you can sustain these very high voltage um, current flows. Um, essentially because there's no chaotic dispersal of energy, um, the electrons are not bumping into each other. Um, and it should be noted that while it is a zero entropy system, it also has entropy. And this is one of those quantum uh, weirdnesses. But this 
creation of superconductors is highly useful um, in MRIs because you're able to generate these very strong, powerful magnetic fields from this electricity flowing. And shockingly, it actually requires very low electrical input. Um, really, all of the energy cost and energy consumption comes in keeping the thing super cooled, right? And you need to maintain the superconduction. Um, otherwise, it, uh, okay, so what, what can happen in MRI is that if you lose the superconduction, you have this sudden, uh, I don't know if it's an implosion or explosion of energy where suddenly all the electrons which are held in this single wave function, they lose their, uh, their super properties and they lose their shared wave function and suddenly they become chaotic and bumping into each other. And so MRIs are actually uh, ready with this giant bank of, of uh, liquid nitrogen just to cool down the system rapidly in the event of a loss of superconduction. And this is called a magnetic quench um, in the MRI world. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, we'll come back to this notion of superconductors, superfluids, um, and lasers. Lasers are essentially um, when photons share a single wave function. Um, and we can go into the details of, uh, of why, why they're able to share the single wave function. Uh, but we'll come back to this in the discussion about quantum computers uh, near the end of this of this episode. Alrighty, so experiment three. We've talked about the double slit experiment, which really illustrates the measurement principle, collapsing the wave function, reducing things into measurable states. We talked about the superpositions and how if you supercool the system, you can create these macroscopic, large-scale superpositions of many, many, many physical atoms um, or electrons or photons. And now, finally, uh, we're going to talk about entanglement. And entanglement, like I mentioned a bit earlier, is the idea that multiple systems can share information in sort of a way that violates our notions of space and time. So this, to, uh, to set the stage, um, Einstein was actually against this notion of entanglement and thought that this is probably not real, probably not how the universe works. And he actually worked with some other scientists to create a sort of paradox um, laying the groundwork for entanglement uh, to be studied in future experiments. So Einstein believed in local realism. And this is the idea that everything that's causal or anything that influences anything else must be restricted to a local region of space. So if one photon is going to interact with another photon, they have to be near each other in order to bump into each other, right? It's pretty much that simple. I'm sure there's a bit more complexity to it. Um, and so the idea of entanglement is can we set up two photons and then separate them in space and then make it so that the two photons share an influence on each other. And so these experiments were actually conducted and what they found was, yes, indeed, you are able to create these entanglement relationships. So you can set up two photons you basically create sort of like sister photons. Um, one way that you can do this is you have a laser, you shoot it through a quartz crystal and diffract the photons into, into you know, separated from each other. And then the photons have shared this, this superposition together. They've essentially been merged into a single wave function. And then now you are separating them in space. And so we can take one photon, put it in our galaxy, and another photon, move it to the Andromeda galaxy. And you have these two photons separated by space. And now when we simultaneously measure the two photons, what do we see? Well, you can have correlated results of the measurement. So let's say one photon always says one, the other photon always says zero and vice versa, if it's a zero, then it's also a one. So you can have these correlated measurements, um, and of course these are imperfect experiments, so it's not like a one-to-one -one always related to each other. 
Uh, but you can basically set up these, these bell states where photons will influence each other or they'll sort of be related to each other even though we did simultaneous measurements and even at the speed of light information couldn't travel from one photon to the other which means that they have to be related to each other in this you know spaceless timeless uh sense and i haven't talked about the time part yet and i probably won't in this video but you can also make these temporal violations where you can defy simple temporal notions more on that later um so david bohm has a really good analogy or way of thinking about this and the way that he talks about it is that yeah we have two different cameras and we're pointing them at let's say two different fish and we say oh my god when this fish turns its head the other fish always turns its head and then when the fish swims that way this other fish is swimming this other way and they're always related they're always correlated to each other and then david bohm says well maybe the cameras are actually looking at the same fish right and so we're really just pointing two different cameras at one fish and when the fish moves we're saying wow like the measurements are correlated and it's like well yeah of course it is it's just one fish uh the problem is is that this fish is now spatially extended into two different universes simultaneously <laughs> right so this would be a very bizarre fish and so entanglement creates these scenarios of spacelessness of timelessness Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about quantum computers and how it sort of puts all these principles together and then I'll talk about how this relates to consciousness. So in a quantum computer, quantum computers use all three of these principles simultaneously. So the idea with a quantum computer is that the goal is to make a very large wave function where you can have many, many states wrapped up into a single processor. So here you have quantum bits and quantum bits or qubits are your basic unit. And these basic units are, imagine them like those liquid helium, right? These little helium atoms. They have, for simplicity's sake, let's say they have a zero state and a one state. And the quantum bit, if we can get it to be into a wave function with a bunch of other qubits, then our quantum computer is now a single wave function governing a bunch of quantum bits. So we can scale up our quantum computer to have as many quantum bits as possible. And this is the same process that we're, that we're using to create superconductors, superfluids, right? We want to take these individual chaotic systems acting on their own typically, and we want to coalesce them into a single wave function, a single quantum computer, right? Once you've created the quantum computer, you need to interface with it. How do you interface with a quantum computer? Through measurement, you guessed it. So we need to measure the quantum computer. We reduce it into a physical state, zeros and ones. We can set it up in a certain particular arrangement of zeros and ones. And then we allow the wave function to evolve all these quantum bits are mixing their information together. And then after an amount of time has passed, we measure the quantum computer and it gets reduced into physical states once again. And we read out the result of that measurement. So quantum computers have this very cyclic nature to them where you're measuring them, getting digital physical information, allowing them to evolve and then measuring them and reducing them further. Um, and I'm going to devote multiple episodes coming up real soon just to quantum computers and providing sort of a framework for digital computation and relating that to quantum computation. All right, entanglement. So we haven't really talked about entanglement. There are certain properties of quantum computers um, where we could harness entanglement or quantum computers being inherently quantum mechanical we can start tapping into entanglement to make sort of very bizarre technologies that defy modern technologies like in principle. So one example is this notion of uh, quantum currency. So very similar to modern cryptocurrency, 
the notion of cryptocurrency is that it's unable to be hacked or it's very difficult to hack because um, you have you have basically so much encryption that it takes an astronomically long time to hack into a into a, a crypto uh, coin uh, in order to sort of steal the coin. Well, in quantum mechanics, due to entanglement, there are certain properties such as the no cloning theorem where you can have uh, a wave function which is unable to be copied in principle. And so you can set up uh, systems of encryption where essentially based on this uniqueness of a wave function, these entanglement properties, you can essentially create unhackable currency in principle. Um, and so you should look into that more on your own and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to expand on this more in future episodes. But essentially entanglement is a domain of applications of quantum computers, which we're only starting to like scratch the surface of what of what is really possible there. All right. So what does this mean for human subjective experience? Well, if you are a quantum computer and if you are a quantum system that obeys these three different properties, the measurement principle would essentially dictate that as we look around the world, everything is physical. You've never seen a superposition because every time you measure it, it gets collapsed into a particle. So you look around, it's just a bunch of particles. It's just a bunch of stuff all around us, right? So quantum mechanics very naturally explains and gives rise to this naive notion of a physical world. We believe we live in a physical world. Every time we measure stuff, it's physical. And yet through science and through repeated experimentation, we can uncover that there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes. And even though at any given iteration of the double slit experiment, we always just measure a single point, but through ex you know repeated experimentation, we can see the interference pattern. So we can infer and we know that superpositions and wave functions are real, even though you can never directly measure them yourself. Right, they're kind of like a statistical phenomena, if you will. So in terms of our notion of consciousness, quantum mechanics very straightforward derives the perception of a physical world. Okay, so that's one point. Uh, superposition, how does this manifest? Well, in our conscious experience, we have the idea of being a single person. And the wave function is a very natural way to create a single conscious entity or to just create a single entity that governs a physical extended body, if you will. So there's a single wave function that is spatially extended. And yes, this is a metaphor. Yes, you know, can we move beyond the metaphor? Not right now. But the idea is that you have this superposition of multiple possible futures and you're extended over a body of some kind and the superposition might represent different possible futures or actions that you could choose and then you choose one of these actions it gets collapsed and locked into physical reality and causes some sort of um, response in the universe around you but the superposition might be um, some sort of way to, to think about the possible choices, the multiple choice options you get every day when you're going through your life and making de uh, decisions. All right, and then the entanglement. So what does entanglement mean for consciousness? Well, entanglement might be the substrate of platonic forms. So because it's spaceless, it's timeless, it's sort of this web of entanglement relationships. There's ways of deriving, you know, or at least there's some framework for maybe one day understanding how you can have these concepts and these forms and these things that go beyond space and beyond time. And they exist in this sort of conceptual dimension. And I think another implication is that it suggests that we live 
in a deeply interconnected world. And even though we're all siloed off into our own wave function of human experience, there are these meaningful, genuine relationships that we form between individuals or with a collective that sort of defies physical notions and just, you know, defies the limitations of space and time. Um, and we'll really be diving into this uh, when we discuss uh, Carl Jung and the collective unconscious and a lot of these notions of um, sort of a web of conscious beings forming some sort of matrix or network um, that defies the individual. All righty. So I think that's about it for today. We've introduced measurement, superposition, and entanglement. Measurement, mapping onto that physical world, the measurable universe. Superposition, sort of the substrate of creating entities and creating entities that have multiple choice decisions to be made that will then be collapsed into a physical reality. And then this notion of entanglement, of going beyond space and beyond time and creating relationships um, that essentially extend beyond any individual and yet still make a profound impact on the physical world. All righty. So I'll talk to you again in the future. It was fun discussing this. Uh, in the next video, we'll be talking about different theories of quantum mechanics. So Copenhagen interpretation, uh, the many worlds theory, um, Roger Penrose's self-collapse of the wave function. We'll go through all of these. So signing out for today, please like and subscribe. Looking forward to chatting more with you.